This is the Dairy Download, brought to you by EverAg Insights and the International Dairy Foods Association, where we offer extra sharp market and policy insights on dairy. I'm your host, Phil Plord. And I'm your co-host, Kathleen Wolfley. Today's episode is all about feeding programs and dairy nutrition. Our guests this week are on the front lines of efforts to help Americans facing food insecurity. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, Kathleen, where are we now? Phil, can you believe that it's the fourth quarter already? We're talking about... How did that happen? I know, seriously. CME spot prices as of Wednesday, October 2nd. CME block cheddar closed at 203, down 15 cents of the week. Barrels at 215, down 28 cents. Spot butter, the lowest level since January. Closing yesterday at 268, 18 cents lower. And the non-fat dry milk market finished at $1.36, down two cents on the week. Phil, what's your most important thing right now? You know, we are officially in autumn, right? And it's been warm in a lot of places. It doesn't really feel like autumn here. The the, the trees are not turning fast here in the central part of the United States. And so it feels like we're kind of delayed a little bit on autumn. But one thing that's happening fast all of a sudden is our dairy markets which sometimes, you know, kind of peak in early Q4 and come apart. Well, the, it's like the, the leaves fell off the dairy trees here in the past week or so. So what's the most important thing right now? Where's the bid? Where is the bid for butter, blocks, and barrels? September 18th, since September 18th, 10 trading days. Blocks down 22 cents. Barrels down 47 cents. Butter down 33 cents. And I think, you know, are these oversold? Are we going to have a little early drop and then bounce back in some of these markets? For butter, we've seen different patterns. You know, 22 and 20, you know, 23 were early, but it was over the first time it declined. 2015, we went down early, came back. All kinds of permutations. So I want to know where is the bid for cheese and butter at this moment? It's the most important thing right now. And you, I'm guessing, might be talking about something similar. Yeah, my most important thing is exports, kind of where's the bid on exports. So we have, particularly on the cheese side, we have cash shuttle cheese six-month futures that are at a pretty big discount to where the European market is sitting. And you just have to wonder, are folks starting to build some exports for first half 2025 at these type at this at this wide of a gap between EU and US pricing? We've heard some rumblings that Oh, folks are making a little bit more MOTS here and there. Um, I think generally the MOTS market has been a little bit tighter uh, in recent weeks. So I think just as we look ahead to what how, how could Q4 shake out, there's a big question of are we going to catch an export bid for early 2025 uh, given the week, recent weakness in, in prices relative to the EU? Or even a, kind of a spot-like export bid, right? So just for context... European mozzarella price about 240 a pound, 243. It's been stuck there for a few weeks in dollar terms. So, but that's high. Uh, the EU butter price, we've seen that market come off pretty sharply in the futures market the past week. But the last, the Dutch quotation print this week, I think was 390 a pound. So there's some room there. So, yeah, is that bid that I'm looking for going to come from overseas? Big question. Yeah, for sure. And that kind of rolls into my stat of the week, Phil. Our estimates suggest that 2% of dairy exports and 85% of dairy imports roll through those East Coast ports that are on strike or started striking here this week. So um, stat of the week, 2% of dairy exports, 85% of imports through East Coast ports. How will that impact dairy trade going both ways here into the fourth quarter? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the prospects for this work action have been known for a while. And I think, you know, a lot of press about how some importers in particular have been booking ahead, you know, taking stuff in early just in case. And so whether that means we've got the uh, the Irish butter and the UK cheddar stacked up to the gills, you know, ahead of this or not, I, I don't know. And if this is a two week thing, whatever, right? Um, if it's a two month thing, I think we got trouble on, you know, I don't know if, from a dairy market perspective, maybe, right? Um, from a macro perspective, 
you know, you're talking about, you know, if you're looking for a BMW uh, to take home your French Brie from the supermarket, uh, that new BMW might be hard to find if we're two months into this uh, into this uh, port action. And they seem, I mean, they rejected a 50% p- price in, uh, wage increase earlier this week, and they are speaking uh, with, with a firebrand energy uh, around the topic. So we'll see what happens. My stat is 36 months. Uh, And that is what I measured as the average interval between interest rate changes going back to 2001. So the Fed lowered interest rates a couple of weeks ago. Big news, you know, hoo-ha, all right, what's going to happen to the stock market tomorrow morning? All those things. I think the bigger story is that once the Fed goes in a direction, they stay in the same direction for an average of 36 months. So we've gone from a rate, high rate environment where we were steady or higher to steady for a period of time. And now I think we are flipping the script to a lower to steady for a period of time. And history says 36 months, not many one and dones in that environment. So, uh, and if we get economic weakness out of this port strike or, you know, I mean, it, 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 the story can feed on itself a little bit. So that's my stat of the week. Here's a question for you though, Phil, what would change that? And what, what would change the fed's mind? I suppose that the labor market never breaks, um, I would suppose that if we start seeing um, inflation quickly, uh, you know, I think they might say, "Whoa, wait a second. You know, I mean, let's just say that. You know, let's let's take a tangible example. We have a you know turmoil in the Middle East. Just to put it mildly, crude oil hasn't really gotten excitable about that. But let's just say crude oil went to one hundred twenty dollars because of some of this military stuff in the Middle East, and gasoline went back to you know four dollars a gallon or something like that. That would you know that would ding the inflation numbers higher." Um, I don't, I mean, I don't know. Then you have this like real concern of, okay, do I fix the inflation or do I try to pump some more life to the economy? I, I, you know, so it would take something pretty dramatic, I think, to, to turn things around over the short run. Yeah. It kind of seems like the interest rate d- discussion is more of a very, very slow ship to turn. And once it's going in one direction, as you noted, it's typically s- continues to go in that direction for a while. Yeah. And I think that's probably, you know, we're seeing commodity funds kind of getting, you know, cutting short positions. It could be bullish commodities, you know, writ large. So we'll see. Okay, Phil, what's your fearless prediction? I don't know if I have fearless predictions these days. I'm making fearful predictions. I don't know. Um, a little little beaten up. But we're going to have, we're going to talk about cheese exports at every stop of the way today. Um My prediction is that based on this price gap that we're seeing for next year, that we will see cheese exports top, I was going to say 80 million pounds, but that's kind of, that's maybe not very bold. Let's say cheese exports. That's kind of weak sauce, yeah. Yeah, come on. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm checking myself right now. I'm fact checking myself. Let's go with 90 million pounds or more on average first quarter exports per month in 2025, cheese exports. that's That's pretty spicy. That's pretty spicy. I'm going to go with butter. I think that spot butter will retrace back to $2.80 a pound before it hits $2.50. So I I suspect we're getting a little bit of bounce back here. So you're in the oversold bounce back camp. Yep. Yep. What's that? The the analogous year is 2015, right? Yeah. I mean, we went all the way back that time, but we'll see. We'll see. Only time will tell, as they say. Well, the time tells us it's time to wrap up this segment and get to our first guest. For sure. (laughs) Let's get to our first guest. We're excited to welcome Nishant Roy to the show. Nishant serves as Chobani's chief impact officer, where he oversees community impact, philanthropy, and government relations. Prior to joining Chobani, he worked at the United States Agency for International Development and Goldman Sachs. Nishant, thank you for joining us on the Dairy Download. Thanks so much, Phil. It's so great to be here. So Chobani recently introduced a pretty unique product. Talk to us about super milk and how does that fit into the Chobani mission and how is it developed? All those fun things. Uh, it's so great to be here, honestly, to talk about this. This is, you know, there we, we've gone out to the communities uh, across the country and we've been wanting to look at how uh, we can deliver protein at scale. And one of the top five requested items that we hear about from food banks and pantries is dairy. 
Uh, in fact, many can't even service that level of dairy because of lack of access to refrigeration. And when they do, when they do have refrigeration, they're too infrequently are they able to go and deliver uh, milk out to those that need it most in the, across the country. Separately, before I, I worked even here at Chobani, I actually worked on responding to disasters all across the world uh, in, in, when I was at the U.S. Agency for International Development. And one of the top uh, commodity items that's requested after a disaster is actually milk. Why? Because it's a great form of hydration. Uh, it's delivering all of your essential vitamins and minerals. And then, of course, it's got great access, an excellent source of protein. Um, otherwise, alternatively, what we'd be distributing, you know, would be bars, uh, a lot of power bars and, and whatnot. Uh, so taking that into account, chobani has got this bias for action. And Hamdi had uh, sat down with Becca Dietrich, who is uh, one of our vice presidents for Impact here. And he said, I want to create a product that is shelf stable but it has got more nutrient density than just any, any regular type of milk. It's got to have the Chobani touch. And so from that birthed uh, Chobani Super Milk. And what makes it super really is that it's got 50% more protein than uh, regular milk, and it's got 25% less sugar, and it actually has seven grams of prebiotic fiber uh, called Goss that's inside each and every 32 ounce uh, container. And the best part is that we've been able to cra craft this milk uh, and make it something that's shelf stable. Okay. So it's got 50% more protein, 25 less sugar and fiber. How does that impact the flavor? It tastes literally just like regular milk. Uh, it, it, uh, in fact, I've been asking um, our American Red Cross partners. We launched this product in July of, of 2024. And, you know, what's unfortunate is that it's been deployed at least three times already. Um, I'm saying it's unfortunate because of the magnitude of the amount of crises that have happened in our country uh, that we're deploying the super milk. But the American Red Cross doesn't normally... Um, want to take in-kind donations from, from businesses. They want to try to raise more capital and keep their budgets more nimble and agile to go and purchase more commodities to go and deliver them to mass, the masses. And they've been coming back to us and telling us, hey, this thing is delicious and it's actually flying off the shelves. And if you can actually produce more of it than you are right now, um, we would gladly take it in response to the hurricanes, wildfires that we're responding to across the country. So how did you develop the product to be shelf stable and with those higher nutrients and keeping the flavor of milk? We started to, we went to our research and development team. We said, Hey guys, here's the, here's the call to action. We have a commodity that we buy a ton of because we're best known for the yogurt that we make. We're also now making, uh, creamers for coffee, uh, which, um, has been doing really, really well as a business. We're also putting milk into this coffee business that we've created, uh, we bought called La Colombe. Um, so we have different use cases for milk. Can we find a way to create a product that's shelf stable? This is a product that you would probably see more in Europe than you would here in the United States. Uh, but how do we make it more nutrient dense in the process? There's other brands that are out there here within the United States that have started to produce a shelf stable milk but it hasn't really caught on in the same way. Uh, and now we're hearing from retailers, hey, I love what you started here with Chobani Super Milk. Um, how, do you, how, do you, how do we work together to figure out how to make this even more nutrient dense uh, for the public? And so one of the things that we, we did, we said, okay, research and development team, how do we create a product that's going to be better than just regular milk? How do we make sure that it's fortified? How do we adhere to the Chobani standards that everything that we make, it follows a very simple acronym that it's DNNA. It's got to be delicious first and foremost. Otherwise, no one will pick it up. It's got to be nutritious. It's got to be natural and it's got to be accessible. And when I say accessible, it's not different points of distribution of where you would find it in a store, but also accessible price point. And what's unique about this product is that it is uh, completely for free. 
given that it's the biggest commodity that we buy, uh, we've leaned in on wanting to go and purchase more uh, milk so that we can go and deliver this out to the masses. And what's been really encouraging, by the way, I, I, you know, is that the dairy farmers of America have come forward and said, look, we love what you guys are doing with Shibani Super Milk. We'd love to actually sell this to you for less of a price than what we normally would. Uh, and the same thing goes for Tetra Pak, who does a lot of the packaging that allows for us to keep this shelf stable. So these have been really encouraging, you know, signs uh, in our in in the product that we made, as long along with the uh, the um, the development of it. So let's talk about that distribution for a second and accessibility. So this is not a retail product; it's not something that's found on store shelves. It's going straight to people that are you know impacted by natural disasters. Is there a food and security piece of this as well? Food feeding and program dimension? It, absolutely, Phil. So we have we have two different ways in which to deploy this product today. Uh, Chibani Supermilk is going out to the American Red Cross to go and engage on disaster disaster relief and response. The second channel in which we're engaging is in the communities, uh, specifically in the Magic Valley in Idaho, where we call home. And in upstate New York uh, and central New York, specifically another community, which we call home, um, we're di distributing it to the, uh, the two food banks that are in uh, central New York and the one food bank that's servicing the entire state of Idaho. Uh, this has been uh, a product that uh, has been really well received by all three banking partner, food banking partners, as well as the 71 pantries that we partner with. It's, they've exhausted actually their supply probably within a week and a half. Yeah. One of the things that, you know, we've talked to feeding program folks over the years, we've gotten a, um, you know, I mean, there's a logistical dimension to milk that is create, you know, perishable products that create challenges for food banks. The shelf stability has got to be a huge hook, right? Absolutely. Yeah. When, one of the things that we're actually doing each month, once a month, we do a surge in the community where we're getting volunteers from the factory to come in, grab Chobani Super Milk, uh, as well as grab some of our yogurt products and go and deliver it out to the 71 pantries that we're servicing. And what makes it uh, really great for those pantry partners is not only they're getting a shelf stable item that they can now keep uh, readily available for folks that are going to go visit their pantries, but they also now have yogurt, uh, which is going to, which is addressing a dairy gap uh, that we're seeing across the board in pantries uh, across the country. And what makes dairy uniquely suited to address the nutritional needs of people facing hunger, food security, these disasters? You know, I mean, Chobani's, you know, in the dairy industry, obviously enough. Um, what's the dairy dimension to all this from where you sit? What's really holy about dairy in particular is we were able to create a product that um, really highlights all of the great aspects of dairy, right? It's got, it's very rich in vitamin A, C, D, magnesium, potassium. Um, there's no product that sold in stores today that can actually get you all of those nutrients, can get you all the essential amino acids in one place. Um, it's one of the best values that you can probably uh, give to any consumer across the country. Um, and what's really remarkable about milk is it's got this hydration element, right? So uh, it is helping out uh, folks not only with getting all of their those essential vitamins and minerals and macronutrients, but it's also giving them some form of hydration in the process. So there's something very truly special about this gift that Mother Nature has given us in, in the form of milk. And how we well, that is is going to be something that's going to be extremely uh, important, you know, for the future kind of hydration and response and recovery efforts. This might be a silly question, but can you put super milk on cereal? I mean, is it does it go beyond just beverage milk? I'll, I'll just say this: my my daughters, I have two young girls, uh, and I'm always just like any parent. I'm very anxious about what they're having in the morning before they leave the house, and I actually happen to give them super milk from time to time. And it's those days in which they're getting the super milk that I actually feel great. Even if they had a half a cup or they mix it into their cereal or they uh, put it into their French toast as part of the base, 
Um, I feel really, really good about the, the super milk that they're having. Um, they, I know they, at least they got their essential vitamins and minerals and protein. So it's not just for drinking. It's not just for drinking. So I guess with that in mind, do you see a future beyond just the, uh, just helping to meet people's nutritional needs, um, in, in more crisis situations? Do you see a commercial play here with super milk? Such a great question. You know, we it, we've heard directly from our retail partners across the country. They are so excited about this product, particularly it's you know a non for profit uh, you know purpose and how it's going to get out there to go and support communities that they service, but also that there's not that many great options that are on the shelf today for the American consumer in terms of getting a shelf stable milk. And uh, we've heard directly from the retailers. They said, hey, we want to see a product like this commercialized. Could, which, could you sell us the super milk? And um, we will probably come out with something in the future. Uh, but for now, we're keeping this product purely for non-for-profit purposes. Um, but we've heard loud and clear from the consumers and from the retailers that this is a product that they're wanting to see and they're wanting to taste. They're wanting us to scale, you know, out to the masses. Beyond the Supermilk Project, which is incredible, what other efforts are you working with Chobani as Chief Impact Officer? What else does that entail? Beyond Supermilk, you know, we're actually taking a very big bet on addressing hunger in communities. Uh, unfortunately, across the entire country, hunger has been on the rise around 30 plus percent. Uh, with hunger on the rise, we need new, innovative, kind of business-like solutions to addressing hunger. And if I look specifically at places like Central New York and in Idaho, hunger has gone up by about forty plus percent. And when I when I think about what that means, uh, I look at how many pounds are we actually short uh, of getting food out to the communities. We've gone out to the food banks. We said. How, what, if you were to think about how to address hunger in those communities, what, is, what does that look like to, to you guys? And they said, what we're trying to solve for is 15 pounds per individual per month. And after doing some rough calculations, we found that in a place like the Magic Valley in Idaho, you got a shortfall of about a million pounds of food. So can we come up with a model that's a business-like approach that's going to allow for not only growers, uh, farm growers, food manufacturers, retailers to all come to the table and uh, give food to the food banks, but then ultimately distribute it to those that are in need in the Magic Valley and set up the appropriate partnerships like with Habitat for Humanity, like with the local um like, like with the local universities to go and build skills and really start to address what's called the social determinants of health. If you can create this flywheel of, of partners along the way, and everyone knows that, hey, Chibani and the retailers and the food manufacturers are at it in terms of improving food accessibility, and they're using their workforce in order to get food out into the last mile into people's hands, and they in, par in partnership with... NGOs like the Habitat for Humanity or the universities or others, they're actually starting to tick away at the social determinants and helping people get to sign on to benefits, get homes. We really could break the cycle of poverty that has been growing in our country and really go and address hunger and the root cause of hunger. Uh, you know, you've seen the headlines in this election year. Food costs are on the rise. Uh, Hamdi's been really outspoken about how uh, food businesses in particular need to lean in. They need to find ways in which to keep food accessible. And, uh, you know, this is this is a moment in time, really unique moment in time where business can be that force for good, uh, where people can rely on business to go and help them address some of their more immediate needs. So this zero hunger strategy is something that we're just extremely proud of, but it's going to require a lot of thoughtful partners to build along the way. Um, so I'm, I'm just very excited about what that could mean for you know communities, like particularly in the Magic Valley and in Central New York. Well, Nishant, really appreciate you joining us on the Dairy Download and giving us the scoop on Supermilk. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be here. 
we are in this fight together to deliver good food to more people. And it starts with one of the most precious commodities and that's dairy. Now let's hear about how a nonprofit is partnering with the dairy industry. We're excited to welcome Gerard Matthews to the show. Gerard is the Senior Director of Commodity Foods for Dairy at Feeding America, the nation's leading domestic hunger relief charity. In that role, he works with partners from across the supply chain to address food insecurity with the nutritional benefits of dairy. Gerard, thank you for joining us on the Dairy Download. Yes, thanks for having me. Pleasure being here. So let's get right into it. Feeding America. Tell us about Feeding America. Talk about the organization, its reach, and, and what its mission is. Definitely. Um, I thought I would start there and just provide a little context to who we are. You know, Feeding America is the nation's largest hunger relief organization, supporting tens of millions of people to get the food and resources they say they need to thrive as part of a nationwide network of more than 200 food banks, 21 state partner food bank associations, and over 60,000 agency partners, food pantries, and meal programs. But for today's conversation, we're in the dairy space. And, uh, you know, just in general, there's a movement to end hunger underway in this country, and it needs all of us to work together. The movement can concede, succeed when people are facing hunger apart and our hearts are in, in places where they need to be. And policymakers and organizations and people everywhere are united with them to deliver innovative processes and programs to increase nutritional access, prioritize dignity, expand opportunity, and improve health for all. You know, Feed America is committed to an America where no one is hungry. And how, um, how are you partnering with the dairy industry in that, in that effort? Sure. Um, I'll take you on a quick journey with that. Uh, since roughly 2012, we formed a relationship with uh, Dairy Management Inc. and the dairy industry to set out to improve access for dairy, for dairy across our Feeding America network. Our initial partnership even began before 2012, was focused more on nutritional education only and after learnings from our food banks and our agencies across the network, we quickly realized that not only the nutrition education was important, but also there was an opportunity to build another arm to our partnership, and that was dairy access. And, uh, and building those opportunities have, have, have brought us to where we are today. And historically, just for context, in terms of dairy access, our network didn't have much access to fresh dairy like milk, cheese, and yogurt. Um, we just um, focused mainly on, on uh, our retail partnerships and, you know, those that came in and from donations from our national partnerships as well. So that was uh, occasionally in terms of our national partnership and our don donation platforms. But mostly it, it was derived from our retail partnerships and what we picked up from retailers across the country. So when it comes to that fresh supply, you know, our conversations with people within food banks and in the feeding movements, is that about sort of like just like basic cooling infrastructure? I mean, is that part of the challenge of fresh for, for Feeding America and other food organizations? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, you're, you're, you're on point, uh, Phil. Uh, one of those uh, barriers, so to speak, historical barriers for our network to really access you know, fresh dairy, uh, the dairy that provides dignity, like you and I go to the grocery store and have access to. Yes, refrigeration capacity is definitely one of those uh, barriers. Uh, perishability and the need for our network to really have, you know, a proactive distribution plan in place because of the perishability uh, is another. Uh, and, and then one of the things that we found that was in trying to navigate this dairy space and more access to fresh dairy, we knew we couldn't just depend on just donated product. You know, dairy is one of the most requested uh, foods in our network, but least donated. So we knew we couldn't just rely on those occasional donations when uh, the supply of dairy was available for donation. And so we moved forward to build these programs, these partnerships that we are having today and building today to do just that, to access uh, not only donations, but also build purchasing arms with our dairy industry partners to have consistent dairy access. And, and one of the other uh, challenges um, also, Phil, 
is that dairy, as we know, is, is very regional and local focused. And being that, it makes it very interesting to navigate and scale across our country uh, as it relates to pricing and things of that nature and the supply chain access. So those are just some of the bar- those are some of the barriers that we come across in general as a network when we're trying to uh, gain more access with dairy. If you don't mind, I'd like to zoom out a little bit. Can you talk to me a little bit about food insecurity today in America and how that's changed in recent years? Are we seeing Americans more food insecure today than they were, say, pre-COVID? Yeah, unfortunately, Kathleen, you know, I would love to be to give a positive answer in this space, in this to this question. But we know the number of people living in food insecure households in the United States, based on USDA data, in 2023 rose for the second consecutive year, with last year making the highest rate and number of individuals and children since 2014. You know, there's an estimated 47 million people, including nearly 14 million children in the U.S. were living in food insecure households in 2023. That's a that's an increase of 6% and 4% respectively from the previous year. So what are some of the big barriers that are keeping Americans food insecure? Yeah, um, good question. You know, when people think about food insecurity, traditionally, normally they think about food, right? Food insecurity is more is not is more than just food. Uh, our neighbors facing hunger tell us that things like cost of living, housing, employment, and health are factors. In addition, you know, coming off of the pandemic, post pandemic era, you know, those post pandemic era relief efforts, which have now all have sunsetted, makes it even more difficult for our neighbors to have access to the foods they think and feel they need to thrive. Is there anything in particular about dairy products? I mean, they're popular, they taste good. And, you know, as you said, we enjoy, the, you know, the people on this call enjoy the dignity of being able to go to the grocery store and get the yogurt, the sour cream, whatever we want, right? Mm-hmm. But is there anything in particular about the nutritional value of dairy that fits nicely into uh, feeding America's mission? Yes. Yes. Good question, Bill. Um, you know, <clears throat> working in, in dairy, is, is, and again, you know, one of our priorities was get, you know, nutritional products overall into our Feeding America food banks. You know, that's one of our priorities, whether that's uh, produce or protein or and including dairy. And what we've really trying to focus on moving this, this initiative forward now is dairy foods is a powerhouse of essential vitamins, that nutritional aspect that you are getting at, uh, of essential vitamins and minerals. Not only do they contain, you know, crucial nutrients, but they also help reduce risks of chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes and heart diseases. You know, all dairy milks, including lactose-free milk, provide 13 essential nutrients, including protein and calcium, and others uh, like vitamin A and D and B12, uh, that really provide that nutritional aspect that makes dairy uh, uh, that powerhouse that it can be to fit that that uh, nutritional goal of really uh, providing access for our neighbors in need. Uh, we all need nutritious food for our health and well-being, right? With enough of it, we can protect against those health conditions like the heart diseases and diabetes. The Feeding America Network is committed to working alongside people facing hunger to make sure everyone has what they need to improve their health. Uh, While the focus on our efforts has been on addressing food insecurity mostly, you know, in this particular space for this particular conversation, I see the role of dairy also being a pivotal, uh, being pivotal in addressing nutrition insecurity. Um, And so dairy products provide those four nutrients noted by the 2025 dietary guidelines for Americans as nutrients of public health concern. And dairy includes that, you know, calcium, potassium, and vitamin D. And so we, we are really looking forward and, and, and moving this initiative forward around that nutrition 
uh, conversation in terms of access to fresh dairy. You know, our efforts to increase access to dairy will evolve to take into the considerations the nutritional contributions of food, including dairy, but makes that, you know, important to the lives of the people we serve. So how are you seeing dairy companies, for instance, step up to address hunger and food insecurity and nutritional insecurity through innovation or through other programs? Yeah, a great question, Kathleen. Um, you know, I have I am really excited about the journey that we've had with the dairy industries and their companies and their champions really supporting this initiative at Feeding America. We're seeing dairy companies and stakeholders from across the dairy supply chain build innovative programs and building new partnerships with our network to increase dairy access. These new partnerships are impacting both our don dairy donations as well as our network purchasing power and streams across the country. You know, as a result of these collaborative efforts, Feeding America has seen tremendous growth in our dairy access uh, initiatives with regard to, to the work that we're doing in this space. Uh, when we started this journey, just to give you an example, dairy access with Feeding America Distribution Network was around 500 million servings of milk, cheese, and yogurt. Today, we have reached uh, over 1.4 million servings in that same category. And, and just to keep it in perspective of what the opportunities could be and where we could take this, during the pandemic, distribution peaked to 2.1 million servings, showcasing the industry's ability to rapidly scale in times of crisis. You know, um, you know one of the things that, you know, we're really proud of, of late, we just completed a... Uh, series of, of uh, dairy, um, what we call our dairy symposiums. We just finished our third one uh, and our final one, which we set out to do three uh, over the last three years. And, you know, what we've done is built an interactive multi-day experience where individuals across the dairy supply chain have come to the table to create solutions, build relationships to increase access, to proteins and the nutrients provided by dairy products served in our communities. These symposiums have brought together key stakeholders. And you talk about what the dairy industry have done. They have supported us and, and, and came to the table to build these connections at these symposiums uh, and align resources and, and most importantly, take home action plans that power forward the momentum to increase dairy options at food banks in the communities that we serve. Well, Gerard, we really appreciate all the work that you're doing to help build a more food secure and both on the calories and the nutrition side, American population and appreciate you joining us on the Dairy Download. Yes, thank you. One thing that I'd like to say before we leave, uh, you know, I want to really uh, acknowledge the dairy farmers and the dairy companies that have worked with us every day to provide nutritious foods for all, our, for all the consumers that they do. But more importantly, their commitment to communities in need has helped Feeding America address through these partnerships the dairy servings that we that our that our neighbors are, are lacking and the access to dairy that our neighbors are lacking. You know, without the dairy farmers and the dairy community, uh, this would not be possible and we would not continue to see the growth that we're seeing with these partnerships. So we appreciate all the dairy industry's efforts and applaud them for engaging and collaborating with our food banks. Well said. That's a wrap for today's show. As always, we want to thank our production team, Matt Herrick, Mariah McKenzie, and Andrew Jerome at IDFA, and the Insights team over here at EverAg. If you are interested in what Kathleen and I do for our day jobs, check us out at ever.ag. It's a brand new website as of this week. Remember, if you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. And do you want to join in on the fun? Email us at dairydownload at idfa.org and leave us your pick for the most important thing right now or your fearless predictions to see how you stack up against your hosts. Thanks for listening to the Dairy Download. Until next time, stay sharp. Stay sharp.